Hello and welcome to Acid Base Balance. In this section here, we're going to talk a little bit about the acid base balance in your patient's body and how to assess that by looking at your arterial blood gases. So, first of all, let's get a little bit of background about what acid base balance is and what it is specifically we're going to be looking for in our patients to tell us about acid base balance and what specifically we're going to be looking for as going to be the outcomes or the manifestations of abnormal acid-base balance situations in our patient. First of all, just to give you some idea about what acid-base balance is referring to and why we're looking for a specific range in the body, let's take a look at what some different acidities are of different common things in our environment. So starting out at the very top, we have a very acid type of environment, and then we go from neutral and then all the way down to a very basic or alkaline type of environment. In order to quantify this, we quantify it by using the pH. So a very low pH, a pH of 0 or 1, is going to be very acidic. A pH that's very high, around 13, 14, is going to be very basic or very alkalotic. What we're trying to strive for in our patients is going to be this optimal range of about 7.4. Okay, it says there are 7.5. We'll talk about that in a moment. So let's go through, and you see lemon juice is very highly acidic at 2.0. Squirt some of that in your eye, and you're going to realize how acidic it really is. Wine also is very acidic at a pH of 4. Rain has a pH of about 5.5, so we're getting a little bit closer to what the body is at. And our human blood is around 7.4. The actual range we use is 7.35 to 7.45 as a range as to what our human blood should be. Baking soda has a pH of 8.5. Detergent, so your laundry detergent, has a pH of about 10. And then bleach... Okay, so that being a very strong detergent, is going to have a pH of about 12.5, so very alkalotic. So this is just to give you some idea about what pH is and what kind of things would be acidic, what kind of things would be alkalotic or basic. Now, for the terms of what we're going to talk about here in relationship to the patient's body, we're not going to use the term basic. That's something that's probably used more in a chemistry lab. Here, instead, we're going to be talking about acidotic or alkalotic in terms of our pH. So the power of hydrogen, in other words, the pH, the pH gives us some kind of a qualification of the acidity or the alkalinity of the blood. So how acidic or how alkalotic it is. Now, when we're talking about patients here, okay, you saw the scale from 1 to 14. But when we're talking about patients and we're talking about the human body, we're talking about a very, very narrow range that centers right around 7.4. So notice about three quarters of the way down the page here, it talks about the normal body pH is 7.35 to 7.45. See, nice little narrow range right around 7.4 and the body cannot tolerate having much deviation from that normal range of 7.35 to 7.45. We're going to measure the arterial pH in our patient by measuring an arterial blood gas. You're going to hear this referred to in the clinical area as being an ABG. An ABG is an arterial blood gas. As the name implies, it's measured or taken from an artery, arterial. We're looking at the blood, and we're looking at the gases within the blood. So we're going to talk more about some of those gases in a moment, but let's first of all just talk about the pH part. One of the gases, one of the measurements we take from this blood test is going to be a measurement of the blood pH. As the box on the bottom of the page states, we need to have a normal pH if we're going to have normal functioning of all of the body systems. So that has to be in the normal range. An acidotic condition is a condition where we have a decrease in the pH. Some examples that would cause a patient to have an acidotic condition include keto acids. This happens in patients who ha are diabetic and have ketoacidosis. We can have lactic acids building up in the body. This happens when patients have shock and lactic acid starts to develop in the body. Hydrochloric acid can be the result of having too much acid in the stomach or that acid being mobilized in other ways. So an acidosis 
is going to have a number of different problems, a number of different manifestations in our patient throughout the body. So again, remember, when we're talking about acidosis here, we're talking about having acidosis in the blood. So that's going to be something that will be consistent throughout the entire body. So alteration in cardiac contractions, the heart can't pump well when we have an acidosis, when the pH is outside of the normal range. We'll have a decrease in our vascular response to catecholamines. What this means is that your patient in a fight-or-flight response will not respond the way that they're supposed to because of this acidotic environment. They'll have a decreased response to certain medications. And in fact, there's been several research studies in the past that have shown that by normalizing the patient's pH, they'll have a better response to the medications that we give them. It can also lead to a loss of consciousness by having an acidosis. Alkaline conditions, on the other hand, here we have very high blood pH. Some examples that could cause this would be hemoglobin, phosphate, bicarb, and pancreatic fluids. These are all examples of buffers that are in the body. So we have buffers in the body that are going to buffer our acid and keep it from becoming too much. So having too much acid in the blood, causing too much acidosis, so we have these buffers in the blood. The buffers that primarily are used in the blood are going to be the hemoglobin, the phosphate, and the bicarbonate. The one that we will measure will be the bicarbonate, but understand that the other ones are there. So why do we measure the bicarbonate and ignore the hemoglobin? Well, hemoglobin is pretty stable. So if your patient develops more acid, they will not develop more hemoglobin to absorb that acid. The one that we do develop more of will be bicarb. So if the patient has too much acid in the blood, then the kidneys will produce more bicarb, and we will have more bicarb to try and balance out the acid. So that's why we're measuring bicarb, is because that's the one that's dynamic. That's the one that's going to change. Phosphate and hemoglobin are going to stay pretty consistent. They help with buffering on a day-to-day, -day, every moment-to-moment -moment basis in buffering our pH. They're not going to change when we have an acute situation where the acid the acid amount in the bloody becomes higher. Manifestations of an alkalosis include impaired neurologic function and muscular function. We can have all of these different sensations, nervousness, muscle twitches, and, and tingling sensations. This is, these are all signs of neuromuscular irritability that's occurring in our patient. So once again, we're seeing the results of having an abnormal pH and how that's affecting the tissues in the body in an abnormal way and leading to poor results. All right, so let's take a look at some of the effects of pH. Sorry about all the animation going on here. pH changes affect enzyme function in the body. It affects excitability of nerves and of muscles muscle cells. So if we have a decrease in our pH, we have a decreased excitability of our nerve and muscle cells. If we have an increase in our pH, we have an increase in excitability of our nerves and muscle cells. So it kind of just think about it in terms of whichever way the pH goes, that's the way the excitability is going as well. Either one of these situations could be a bad situation if we're talking about a cardiac muscle cell. So if the pH was too low, we'd have decreased excitability of the heart, then the heart wouldn't contract. That's not a good thing. Uh, well, if the pH is high and we have an alkalosis, well, then we have too much excitability, and the heart can become too excitable and go into a very fast rhythm, and then still we're not going to have a good cardiac output, and the patient could have cardiac arrest. So either one of those situations is not going to be good. As far as our acidosis and alkalosis go, we can have an acidosis alkalosis occurring from one of two different main systems. So the main systems that are going to control our acid-based body balance in the body are the metabolic system and the respiratory system. The metabolic system is going to be controlled by the kidneys. The, the respiratory system obviously is going to be controlled by the lungs. So that one's pretty straightforward. Lung, respiratory those two things to go together. But the metabolic system is a little bit more complicated. There's many, many things in the body that can cause an abnormal blood pH that's metabolic in nature. So for example, your patient could be a diabetic and have diabetic ketoacidosis. That has nothing to do with the kidneys. Okay, So the problem is coming from many different areas in the body. However, the solution for a metabolic problem is the kidneys. The kidneys are going to kick in and they're going to do their piece to try to control the metabolic acid base balance. All right, so the kidneys are going to be the compensatory mechanism to the metabolic problem. The lungs are the compensatory mechanism to the respiratory problem. The lungs are also the cause. So the lungs are the cause and the fact. Whereas the kidneys 
are just going to be the effect, not necessarily the cause, of a metabolic problem. I know that sounds confusing right now. Uh, just keep in mind that if it's respiratory, it has something to do with the lungs. We're looking for a lung problem. If it's metabolic, we have to look further than just the kidney. So what are our components of a blood gas? We're going to start looking at arterial blood gases so that we can determine what our patient's acid-base balance is and then try and figure out what the problem is and where it's coming from. So we need to look at three main components to tell us about acid-base balance. That's going to be the pH, the PaCO2, which is the amount of oxygen that is dissolved in the blood. I'm sorry, the amount of CO2 that's dissolved in the blood. The normal value is 35 to 45. You can remember the normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45 so this is the last two numbers of that previous number that might be one way to remember it 35 to 45 so normal range 35 to 45 bicarb normal range is 22 to 26 and these are the components we're going to be looking for in our blood gas in order to analyze a blood gas, we're going to follow a few steps. First, we're going to look at the pH and determine if the pH is acidotic, alkalotic, or if it's normal. Next, we would look at the PaCO2 and make a determination, is it acidotic, alkalotic, or normal? Next, we look at the bicarb and we ask, is the bicarb acidotic, alkalotic, or normal? Now that we've looked at each one of those three components, we can match the ones that match. In other words, if the pH is acidotic and the CO2 is acidotic, those two things would match. We're going to look at some examples. The pH tells us if the blood is acidotic or alkalotic. So if a normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45, then a pH less than 7.35, what would that mean? Okay, well hopefully you said that a pH less than 7.35 is acidotic, a low pH is acidotic. All right, what if a pH is greater than 7.45, then that obviously would mean it is the opposite, which is alkalotic. Okay, so our CO2 tells us about the respiratory component. One way to remember this is to look at the CO2 and think that the CO2 opposes the pH. The CO2 opposes the pH. Another way to remember this relationship is to write out the acronym ROME, R-O-M-E, respiratory opposite and metabolic equal, respiratory opposite and metabolic equal. Okay, if you don't have that or that doesn't make sense to you, you might want to download the six easy steps to ABG analysis that's available in the course shell. Normal CO2 is 35 to 45. If the CO2 is less than 35, what does that tell us? Remember, it's opposite. It opposes the pH. Okay, so hopefully you were able to figure that one out. A CO2 less than 35 is alkalotic. That means, therefore, then a CO2 greater than 45 would be the opposite. In other words, it would be acidotic. You see how that's different than the pH? When the pH is low, we have acidosis. When the CO2 is low, we have alkalosis. It opposes. It's opposite of what the pH does. How about the bicarb? The bicarb tells us about what the kidneys are doing, the metabolic component. Now, this follows the pH. In other words, let's go back to our acronym ROME, respiratory opposite, metabolic equal, metabolic equal, which means the bicarb goes the same way as the pH. Normal bicarb is 22 to 26, so a bicarb less than 22 is... 
Hopefully you set a bicarb less than 22 is acidotic and greater than 26 is alkalotic, right? If we're lacking a bicarb, bicarb is the buffer and it's going to buffer, it's going to balance the acid. One of the other things that we get on our blood gas is going to be a representation of the amount of oxygen that is in the blood. There's two different pieces of information we get from our blood gas. One of them is called the PO2, the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. This is the amount of oxygen that is dissolved in the blood. The other value we get is an oxygen saturation, SAO2. Okay, we'll see that a little bit later. So oxygen that is dissolved in the blood, normal is 80 to 100 on room air. So that's what that means at RA remains on room air. So the patient is just breathing in the air in the room. They're not on supplemental oxygen. And they have a normal 80 to 100 PO2. It says here that we'd like to prefer a PO2 of 90 to 100, but 80 to 100 is normal. Less than 80 equals hypoxemia. So if our PO2, the amount of oxygen dissolved in the blood, is less than 80, that means that there is a low amount of oxygen in the blood. The medical term for that is hypoxemia, hypo, low, oxygen in the blood. Okay, Hypo is low, ox is oxygen, emia is in the blood. So low amount of oxygen in the blood. All right, let's interpret this. So we have a whole bunch of pHs here. Let's interpret them and take a look at them and try to make some sense out of what's happening with our blood gases. So here's a whole bunch of pHs. Let's take a look at the top one. The pH is 7.36. What do you think about that one? All right, that one's normal, right? The normal value is 7.35 to 7.45. So we're right smack in the middle of the normal range. Okay, how about 7.32? All right, hopefully you said that one was acidotic. So a pH of 7.32 is less than 7.35, therefore is acidotic. All right, how about our pH is 7.49? What do you think about that one? Okay, hopefully you said that one was alkalotic. Yes, in fact, that's alkalotic. It's greater than 7.45 and therefore is alkalotic. All right, how about 7.55? All right, hopefully you said that one was also alkalotic. It's greater than 7.45 and therefore is alkalotic. And lastly, 7.44 is normal. All right, so there are our pHs. Let's take a look at some other values. How about the CO2? So PaCO2. Okay, PaCO2 of 36 is... Hopefully you said normal. The normal range is 35 to 45. Okay, how about PaCO2 of 47, that is? Acidotic. How about your CO2 of 70? Hopefully you also said that was acidotic. All right, we're doing great here. Let's move on to the CO2 of 19. CO2 of 19 is, yes, alkalotic, a low CO2. Remember, it's opposite. It opposes the pH. All right, PaCO2 of 37 is? Normal. Fantastic. Okay, hopefully those were helpful. Let's move on and take a look at our bicarbs. Have a whole bunch of bicarbs here. Let's analyze these bicarbs. The first bicarb is a bicarb of 25. That's normal. Normal value is 22 to 26. We're right smack in the middle there. Okay, let's take a look at that bicarb of 35 then. What does that represent? Hopefully you said it's alkalotic. Yes, it's greater than 26. Therefore, we have more base. We have more alkalotic environment by having more bicarb, which leads to an alkalotic pH. Okay, how about a P or bicarb of 16? That is acidotic. Fantastic. All right, let's move on. Bicarb of 22 is...
This is a toughie here, because isn't our normal range 22 to 26? Okay, so you're going to see this represented in a couple different ways. Some people are going to say 22, all right, we're still good. 22 to 26 is normal range, right? Other people are going to tell you that a 22 is going to be acidotic. What you can get out of that is we're definitely on the border. We don't want to have a value that falls right smack on the lower end of the upper end of the range. So we've got to be careful about these. It's Some people are going to say, and it's normal, you know, because it's 22. It's right there. It's on the normal range. We're going to call it normal. If it was 21.9, we'd say it was acidotic. Other people are going to say 22, that's acidotic. So just be careful when we're hitting right on the upper or lower end of the range that they might that might be interpreted one of two ways. Uh, notice this here, what we're saying on and this uh, last one with the bicarb of 26. So we said the normal range is 22 to 26. And the 26 is the top part of the range. We're saying that's normal. Okay, so shouldn't we say the previous one was normal? Yeah, we probably should. But I'm just telling you so that you know when you get into clinical practice that somebody may say, well, we're borderline acidotic. We're borderline alkalotic when we're hitting on the upper and lower ranges of the values. All right, so let's take a look then. We've talked about the values. We've talked about acid and base. Now let's put it together with the specific components. For example, the respiratory and or metabolic systems. Let's put them together with those so that we can come to a determination of what is happening here, which one of these things is going on. So respiratory acidosis. This is a situation where the patient has a CO2 that is greater than 45 and their pH is going to be less than 7.35. How do we know that? Okay, go back to the name, respiratory acidosis. It's an acidosis, therefore the blood pH must be less than 7.35. It's respiratory, so the CO2 must be greater than 45. Does that make sense? The problem is a respiratory acidosis, therefore our values have to reflect the respiratory system being involved and being acidotic and the blood being acidotic. So causes that could cause a person to develop a respiratory acidosis, we're looking for some kind of primary pulmonary problem. That could be emphysema, that could be bronchitis, it could be pneumonia, it could be pulmonary edema, it could be a number of different things, but we're looking for a primary pulmonary problem. Now there could be something causing that pulmonary problem, maybe the patient's been overdosed on um, narcotics, or the patient just got out of surgery, had a little bit too much pain medication that's slowing down their breathing, but there's a primary pulmonary problem, we're going to assess the pulmonary system to try and figure out where it's coming from. Clinical signs include having a headache, restlessness, confusion. Now you notice a lot of this stuff is neurological. A lot of the symptoms are neurological because as that patient develops a respiratory acidosis, they're also developing a high CO2 level and CO2 causes vasodilation in the brain which causes additional symptoms. The symptoms you see in the middle here, dyspnea, respiratory distress, shallow respirations, those are related to the underlying respiratory problem that's causing the respiratory acidosis. Tachycardia and dysrhythmias are the result of probably both the respiratory problem and the acidosis. Now this very busy picture here shows all of the different things that could be playing into a respiratory and or metabolic acidosis that can cause the patient to have the symptoms they're having. You might want to pause the video at this point and spend some time looking at this slide just to get an idea of what all is going on here. But look over on the very far left side. We're talking about respiratory acidosis. We have decreased removal of, of CO2 from the lungs which causes an accumulation of CO2 in the blood and that's what develops the respiratory acidosis. See that's all respiratory. There's nothing else involved here, just lungs. Now we move over to metabolic acidosis and you can see all of the different components, all of the different mechanisms that could cause somebody to develop a metabolic acidosis. Failure of the kidneys to excrete acids, a metabolic acid building up in the body, production of keto acids that happens in diabetics, absorption of metabolic acids from the GI tract, all of those things causing an accumulation of acid in the blood. Prolonged diarrhea, where we have an excessive loss of bicarb. We're not producing too much acid. We're losing too much bicarb. Or a kidney disease causing uremia. All of those things are causing the metabolic acidosis. So you see lots of causes of metabolic acidosis. One cause of a respiratory acidosis. A respiratory alkalosis.
on the other hand, is going to be caused by having a pH greater than 7.45 and having a CO2 less than 35. Well, how do we know that? Go back and look at the name. It's an alkalosis. An alkalosis means that the pH is greater than 7.45. It's respiratory, which means that the CO2 is the culprit. And in order to be alkalotic, the CO2 must be less than 35. Typically, what happens to cause a respiratory alkalosis is the patient is breathing too fast. We have to get rid of CO2 in order to cause a respiratory alkalosis. We have to be blowing off CO2 in order for this to occur, which means that the person has to be hyperventilating. Pain, fear, anxiety, fever, those things cause the person to hyperventilate, blow off the CO2, and then we end up with a respiratory alkalosis. So clinical signs, again, headaches, restlessness, lethargy, coma, dysrhythmias. Okay? The, the heart does not like having an abnormal blood pH. Another very busy slide here showing us all the different ways that we can end up having an alkalosis. So we have some predisposing factor over on our left hand side here, some predisposing factor that's causing the person to hyperventilate, lose their CO2 and or lose their carbonic acid from the blood, which leads to a respiratory alkalosis. Over on the right hand side, we can have prolonged vomiting, we can have ingestion of excess alkali drugs or uh, excess aldosterone, all those things causing the person potentially to be able to develop a metabolic alkalosis. Okay, so uh, some of the different causes, both of the respiratory and metabolic components. Again, if you'd like to pause the video at this point in time, spend some time with the slide just to kind of get uh, familiar with some of the different causes of respiratory and metabolic alkalosis. A metabolic acidosis on the other hand okay let's look at the terminology let's look at the term it's an acidosis so obviously the pH must be less than 7.35 now this one is metabolic which means it's coming from the bicarb so the bicarb now has to be less than or greater than our normal value spend a minute with that yeah, it's got to be less than 22. So our bicarb is less than 22, and we have a pH less than 7.35. We have a metabolic acidosis. So there's not enough base. There's not enough alkali in the blood, or there's too much acid. So one of two situations is going on here. We're making too much acid. This happens in shock. This happens in diabetic ketoacidosis. This happens in renal failure. Diarrhea, we're losing too much bicarb. Diuretics, we're losing too much bicarb. Certain drugs, we're losing too much bicarb. So it's either too much acid or not enough bicarb in the blood. Clinical signs, you can see them listed there. Kuzmal's respirations are respiratory compensation for metabolic acidosis. On the other hand, we can have a metabolic alkalosis. All right, again, let's go through the terminology of the name. Alkalosis means our pH is greater than 7.45. Metabolic means it's coming from the bicarb. In order for the bicarb to be alkalotic, we have to have a bicarb greater than 26. So what causes a metabolic alkalosis? Well, too much bicarb or too little acid. One way that this can be accomplished is if the person has excessive vomiting, if they have a nasogastric tube in and we're suctioning out their nasogastric tube, pulling acid out of the stomach, if the person excessively uses antacids, it drops the amount of acid being produced in the stomach and therefore drops the amount of acid the patient has. So we can end up having a metabolic alkalosis in those situations. Buffers. Buffers are things that are going to try to control our pH. Remember again, the body does not want to have an abnormal pH. We want to have a pH all the time that's right around 7.4, hopefully between 7.35 and 7.45. That's where we want to be all the time. So the body is going to put these buffers out there, and the buffers are going to be working in the body to try to maintain a normal pH all of the time. Chemical buffers act immediately. So if there's too much acid in the blood and bicarb gets released into the bloodstream, immediately we're going to have buffering occur. 
The respiratory system can buffer. So the respiratory system can compensate. Let's say your patient has a metabolic acidosis where well, the respiratory system can kick in, start blowing off CO2 in order to compensate. That only takes a matter of minutes. That doesn't take long for that compensation to occur. The renal system, on the other hand, can take hours to days. Why? Because the kidneys have to start to recognize that there's a problem, and then the kidneys have to start changing the way they're doing their metabolism. That's not something that happens right away. How this is accomplished, buffering, how buffering is accomplished in your patient's body so that we are controlling our acid and base is through this carbonic acid equation. Over on the left-hand side, we have the lungs, and the lungs are going to deal with two specific components, CO2 and water. Okay, go back up to the top where it says circulation. Underneath circulation, you see it says there water and CO2. Those are the two components that the respiratory system is working with. Over on the right-hand side, the kidney is going to be working with the bicarb and the hydrogen ions. Little H is there, those are hydrogen ions. So those are the things the kidney works with. Now, how do we move from water and CO2 over to hydrogen ions and bicarb. We work through this carbonic acid equation. So you see in the middle of your erythrocyte there, it says H2CO3. If we combine water and CO2 together, we get H2CO3, which can then break down into hydrogen and bicarb. So it's through that carbonic acid through that H2CO3, they were able to move from acids, so from little H's and bicarb, back to water and CO2, back and forth between the lung and the kidney, which allows us to be able to have buffering. So our chemical buffers can act immediately. Those are things such as bicarb, phosphate, sodium, and our hemoglobin. Those things will start to buffer immediately. Too much acid in the bloodstream, just a little bit of acid that was kind of squirted out there, and these buffers act immediately. We never see an acid-base abnormality, never see a problem with it. It's doing this all the time. Now, respiratory, again, is going to work through carbon dioxide, and that's only a temporary measure of being able to try and balance out our acid base balance because the respiratory system if we blow off too much carbon dioxide uh, the patient's going to have additional problems renal system takes hours today is more effective than the respiratory system and buffering something that's going on in a patient's body but it requires bicarbonate it takes hours to days respiratory buffering we're going through the carbonic acid equation which we saw is going to be changes in the amount of co2 we have by blowing it off or by holding more co2 depending upon what kind of acid base abnormality we have so the reason why we have respiratory buffering the reason why we have respiratory you will also hear this referred to as being compensation is because the patient has a metabolic problem if the patient has a metabolic problem and they have an acid base abnormality then obviously the metabolic system cannot fix it or it would have already done so. So now we have to rely on the respiratory system, the lungs, to try to balance out or compensate for the problem. That's called compensation. Renal buffering or compensation occurs with the kidneys. So let's say that your patient has a chronic respiratory problem, like a patient who has COPD, and they chronically hold on to CO2. Well, a high CO2 level is going to lead to a respiratory acidosis. Too much CO2 in the blood is going to cause an acidosis, so the patient's going to have a respiratory acidosis. Well, the lungs can't fix the problem. Right? The patient's got COPD. They have a chronic lung problem. The lungs can't fix the problem. Therefore, what's going to have to fix the problem will be the kidneys. So we get renal compensation or renal buffering. Remember, that takes from hours to days. And the kidneys are going to start to either hold or eliminate bicarb, depending upon what the acid-base abnormality is. Our respiratory response is going to be modulated by chemoreceptors that we find in the brain. So these chemoreceptors are going to respond to the amount of CO2 and the amount of, of acid, hydrogen ions, that we have in the blood to cause our response. We also have chemoreceptors that are 
uh, involved in the carotid arteries, the carotid arteries and the aortic arch. They're going to be responsible for sensing our CO2, our pH, and our oxygen levels in the blood, and they are going to then stimulate the body to make compensation. There are electrolyte shifts that are occur with acidosis and alkalosis. Notice what's happening here in acidosis. Potassium leaves the cell while those little hydrogen ions or acid are coming into the cell. With alkalosis, what we're going to see is the acid leaving the cell and the potassium coming into the cell. This will result in having abnormal amounts of potassium in the bloodstream. Okay, so let's go back and look at this again. Acidosis, potassium leaves the cell. Where does it go? It goes into the bloodstream, so we end up with hyperkalemia. In alkalosis, potassium is going into cells, which means it's coming out of the bloodstream, going into cells, which causes hypokalemia, a low amount of potassium in the blood. One way to remember this is look at the word alkalosis. A-L-K-A. -A. So look at the, the second two letters. LK, low K, low potassium. So whenever we have alkalosis, we have a low K, a low potassium in the bloodstream. Another one of the components of a blood gas is the anion gap. The anion gap tells about the difference between the positive and the negative anions or the ions in the body. A normal gap is about 10 to 15. A high ratio is greater than 15. Low ratio is greater than 10. Now the reason why we look at an anion gap is to tell us about where the metabolic acidosis is coming from. So certain kinds of gaps can give us a clue. What we're measuring when we measure an anion gap is we're measuring the difference between our positive anions. Okay, so we have our anions over on the right hand side over there uh, versus our cations or our, our positive uh, uh, ions which is the sodium versus our negative ions which are the anions and we're measuring the difference in unmeasured cations versus unmeasured anions and that's called the anion gap okay we well, don't really need to get into a lot of detail about this but I just want to give you some background so that you've got some kind of an understanding when people talk about an anion gap and you say boy I don't have the first clue what those terms mean this is what we're measuring what this tells us as it tells us, or helps to tell us at least, where the metabolic acidosis is coming from. Okay, let's take a look at some questions and let's answer some questions about blood gases. Number one, general anesthesia and narcotic analgesics for pain often lead to slow, shallow respirations after surgery. What do you expect will be the effects of carbon dioxide? <laughs> Well, we expect that if the patient has slow, shallow respirations after surgery, that the CO2 level will increase because the patient is not blowing off the CO2. If the CO2 increases, that means the patient's going to develop an acidosis. Which of the following electrolyte imbalance often occurs as a result of acute acidosis? <laughs> If you answered hyperkalemia, you are correct. Remember, alkalosis is associated with a low K, which means that a high potassium is associated with acidosis. A common cause of metabolic acidosis is... If you answered renal failure, you are correct. Diuresis, dehydration, and vomiting will all cause a metabolic alkalosis, not a metabolic acidosis. A common cause of metabolic alkalosis is... So a common cause of metabolic alkalosis...
Vomiting. Vomiting is a common cause of metabolic alkalosis. We are vomiting up and losing acid from the stomach. The patient ends up having a deficit of acid, which leads to alkalosis. Which of the following alterations is evidence that the kidneys are compensating for a respiratory acidosis condition? Hopefully you said an elevated bicarbonate is evidence that the kidneys are compensating for respiratory acidosis. The patient has respiratory acidosis. Okay, the respiratory system obviously can't compensate and fix that, so the metabolic system has to kick in and try to compensate. It does so by elevating, by causing more bicarb to be created. In general, respiratory acidosis is caused by Yeah, if you said respiratory disease causing retention of carbon dioxide, you'd be correct. So we're having respiratory disease. So look for the primary respiratory problem in patients with respiratory acidosis. Okay, how about a respiratory alkalosis is usually caused by... Hopefully you said hyperventilation. Yes, in fact, that's what caused, we're blowing off our CO2 and leading to an alkalotic environment. Which of the following molecules acts as buffers for acid in the blood? All of the above, hemoglobin, albumin, bicarbonate, all act as buffers for acid in the blood. Well, now let's put it all together and let's take a look at some blood gases and see how we can use the information we've learned to interpret what's happening with our patients. So first of all, we have this blood gas here with a pH of 7.20. We have a CO2 of 35 and a bicarb of 14. So if we go through and analyze as we were taught to do before, we would look at the pH first and say the pH is less than 7.35 and therefore is acidotic. Our CO2 of 35 is within the normal range of 35 to 45 so that would be normal and then our bicarb of 14 is less than the normal range of 22 to 26 and also would be acidotic now I talked before about matching up the values notice that the bicarb is acidotic the pH is acidotic so we could match those two things together and we can find that our patient has a metabolic acidosis Oftentimes this is helpful to write down on a separate sheet of paper so that you can put your interpretations to the right of the actual values. So we have our pH is 7.20, you can write right next to it, acidotic. Our CO2 of 35, you can write right next to it, normal. And then our bicarb of 14, you could write on the right side of it there that it's acidotic. That makes it much more clear when you're trying to be able to match up the values when you have it written down and you can see it in black and white right in front of you. So this patient here has an acidosis, and in fact, it's coming from the metabolic component. We see that evidenced by the low bicarb, the bicarb that is also acidotic. Let's take a look at another blood gas here. The pH is 7.20, and okay, and we're continuing on with the previous one, excuse me. And we're, now we're looking at the CO2 or the bicarb, and they're saying which one matches the pH. Now, we did this already, and we said, yes, the bicarb matches, therefore we have a metabolic acidosis. <laughs> 
Well, let's take these blood gases and look at all of these blood gases and try to determine which of the following of these blood gases would reflect the metabolic acidosis. All right, so A, we have a pH of 7.48. Now, remember, if we're looking for an acidosis or alkalosis, we don't need to go through all of our values in order to be able to find this. We can narrow down our list by looking at the pH. It's asking about a metabolic acidosis. So let's get rid of all the stuff, all the pHs that are normal or that are alkalotic. So our pH of 7.48 is alkalotic. So that one clearly wouldn't fit. A clearly wouldn't fit because we have an alkalosis and not an acidosis. All right, well, how about B? In B, we have a pH of 7.30. Well, that is acidotic. Okay, so kind of circle that one there. That might be a possibility. Now let's go down and look at C. C has a pH of 7.27. That's also acidotic. So circle that one. That's a possibility. Then go down to D, has a pH of 7.46, which is greater than 7.45, and the patient would be alkalotic. So we can cross off A, we can cross off D, they're both alkalotic. So now we're stuck with looking at B and C. So let's analyze those two blood gases because we're trying to find the one that is a metabolic acidosis. So let's start with B, pH 7.30. We already said that was acidotic. Our CO2 of 32 is less than the normal values of 35 to 45. However, remember that the respiratory component is opposite of the pH. In other words, our CO2 of 32 is going to be alkalotic and not acidotic. All right, now we move over to our bicarb. Our bicarb of 24 is within the normal range. Okay, so that one doesn't fit. It's it really, we've got nothing going on there. That's probably a bad blood gas because we don't have anything that fits, anything that matches the pH. All right, well, let's take a look at C then. C has a pH of 7.27, and that is acidotic. We have a CO2 of 38. Normal value is 35 to 45, so we're within the normal range. And then our bicarb of 19. 19 is less than the normal value of 22 to 26. And a low bicarb would indicate acidosis. So we have a bicarb that's acidotic, we have a pH that's acidotic, and that in fact would be a metabolic acidosis. So our correct answer is letter C. Well, let's take a look at a case study. In the case study here, we're going to look at a number of different components in our patient, not just the blood gas, but also look at some of the electrolytes too, and talk about how all of these things might change based on a specific patient situation. So here we have Ms. Brown. She's an elderly woman with diabetes who's been too ill to get out of bed for the past two days. She has a severe cough and has been unable to eat or drink during this time. On admission, her lab values show the following. Her sodium is 156. Okay, for your convenience, we have the normal values listed there on the screen. A normal value is 135 to 145. In uh, this particular situation, it says 147. Okay, so now you're going to see some differences as you go through and you look at lab values. The ones you have in your book, the ones you read in another book, the ones that you see in clinical may all be a little bit different. That's because it depends upon which device is doing the measuring. So there's lots of different, like, there's lots of different types of cars out there. There are lots of different types of devices that are used to measure our electrolytes and our blood values in the hospital. So one company may have one brand device, another hospital may have another brand device, and they may give slightly different reference ranges for their particular measurement system. And that's why you see a little bit of a difference in some of the values. Certainly 156 is nowhere near the normal values that we're supposed to have. So whether we're using 145 or 147 as our top value here doesn't really matter because our sodium is listed there. Now keep in mind you're going to have the normal values available to you in your clinical area. So when you have a lab value come up like this and it says sodium 156, it will clearly state what the normal values are next to that lab value. The potassium is 4. A normal potassium is 3.5 to 5 
in most cases. In this uh, situation here, they've listed 4.5. So in one hospital system, they're using 3.5 to 4.5. Um, most of the time, I've seen 3.5 to 5 listed as a normal range for potassium. Either way, clearly, we're in the normal range for potassium. Now we go down and look at our blood gas. Our blood gas has a pH of 7.30. We have a CO2 of 40 and a bicarb of 20. So let's start answering some questions here. What type of water and solute imbalance does Mrs. Brown have? <laughs> So if you said that she has a hypertonic imbalance, in other words, she is dehydrated. She's dehydrated. She has a high sodium level. That's an indication or that's a one of the things we look for to tell us about dehydration. As a patient becomes dehydrated, they lose water, but they don't lose the sodium. Therefore, the sodium measurement, the amount of sodium we're measuring in the bloodstream will seem like it's higher because there's less water to dilute it. Extracellular fluid water has been lost and water from the intracellular space is now being shifted into the extracellular space to try to maintain water balance in the extracellular space. So what kind of symptoms would you expect to find? Well, if you said her symptoms would include thirst, fever, dry mucous membranes, restlessness, tachycardia, postural hypotension, weight loss, weak pulses, etc., you would be correct. So why do we have these? Well, think about being dehydrated. If you were dehydrated, it's a warm day outside, you're working outside all day, what's one of the first things you'd anticipate? You'd probably anticipate having thirst. You would be thirsty. Maybe you would feel dry. Your mouth would feel dry. That's the dry mucous membranes. As you become more and more dehydrated, your body does not have enough blood, enough fluid to pump. And that causes the tachycardia and the postural hypotension, the weight loss, the weak pulses, the decreased ca cardiac output, and the decreased urinary output. As that sodium level goes up, it can cause changes in the level of consciousness, restlessness, convulsions, etc. What do her blood gas results mean? So we have a pH of 7.30, and that is less than 7.35, so that's acidotic. Her CO2 of 40 is right smack in the middle of the normal range, 35 to 45, and her bicarb of 20 is a little bit low because the normal value is 22 to 26. Therefore, her blood gas would be a metabolic acidosis. Take a moment maybe to pause this slide and look at the description of why this is so. Her pH is less than 7.35. Her CO2 is normal. Her bicarb is less than 22. Therefore, we match the bicarb with the pH and we end up with a metabolic acidosis. Well, thanks for joining me for acid-base balance. If you want to know more about your blood gases and acid-base balance, please use the Six Easy Steps to ABG Analysis ebook that is also on your course shell, and that will help you to learn this in a little bit different way and, again, that you can practice more practice examples. Thanks for joining me. Until next time, bye now.